We're talking with Mohammed Furkin about 6G satellites. Mohammed is a satellite communications industry specialist and renowned writer and analyst with multiple publications and keynote appearances at different international platforms. It's great to see you again, Mohammed. Welcome. Thank you, Leo. Thank you for inviting me again. And uh, it's been an honor. Great. Mohammed, you're currently involved in research related to radio frequency electromagnetic spectrum for mobile and satellite communications at Queensland University of Technology. You'd be aware that NASA recently selected Nokia to deploy 4G on the moon. How have the residents of the moon reacted to this announcement? <laughs> and would they have received the news that last week China launched a 6G satellite yeah, uh, a lot of a lot have been going on in space industry, especially these two news which you discussed are making limelight, even in the mainstream media. And if you take a look, uh, let's say five years ago or a decade ago, the satellite or the space industry was not a common uh, topic of discussion for mainstream or social media uh, users. And now it is becoming a mainstream as thanks to uh, our, uh, you can say, uh, billionaires, entrepreneurs like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, uh, things are getting limelighted. Uh, especially uh, if you're talking about the lunar cellular network. Uh, yeah, it's, it has been, uh, it's a good news, but it also uh, attacking a lot of uh, negative response as to say that uh, we don't have 4G coverage all over our own planet and we are looking to deploy 4G over the moon. So uh, let it be very much clear that uh, colonization of moon or colonization of Mars is uh, a step in the future, uh, uh, not uh, really near future. Initially, we will be having, uh, we already have a lot of rovers on uh, the surface of moon and Mars, which are doing expedition for exploration for different uh, scientific purposes. Uh, this network of rovers is going to increase and uh, we will uh, be uh, once the colonization we're talking about once we move to those uh, uh, the moon and mars we will we, we cannot take the uh, raw material from earth to there to establish our colonies so we will have to utilize the materials available on those surfaces so initially uh, there will be a lot of deployment of robotics uh, on those surfaces uh, along with the rovers which will uh, establish the construction or exploration or mining of those surfaces and all those machines, uh, they, uh, uh, we call it machines or robots or devices, they will definitely require a network to communicate with each other and to communicate with the command center that might be on the International Space Station or that might be on the Earth. Yeah. So uh, for that, uh, 4G is going to be deployed initially and IoT, uh, for IoT, uh, which, uh, if, you, if you want to sum up. So the basic purpose for that deployment is IoT, and why not 5G, why 4G? Uh, 5G is still not deployed on Earth, and we have not tested the frequency range one. Uh, we have been working on frequency range one, and we have not uh, uh, experienced the uh, standalone rollout of 5G yet. And uh, so 4G, and uh, initially the number of devices or the things or machines will not be very high. Uh, so we can accommodate them for uh, 4G LTE uh, and their uh, specific NB IoT, narrowband IoT or LTEM. Uh, so I think 4G would be a, a good start. And uh, as you were talking about the 6G uh, launch of 6G satellite by China, yeah. so uh, let it be very clear that uh, 6G is still uh, is not on the paper yet. So uh, deploying a technology which is not on the papers yet. Uh, it's, uh, um, you can say, it's basically a part of Space Race 2.0. So we are, uh, it, it is a commercial as well as a political race. So uh, uh, anything that uh, anyone takes the lead uh, is going uh, through, uh, th this kind of things has to be uh, done with like, you can say, uh, information warfare as well. Okay. Like uh, you have made a claim and uh, that you are going to, uh, you have deployed a 6G satellite. Uh, the only thing that is related to 6G on the satellite is uh, the testing of uh, tetrahertz uh, frequency band, which will be used by 6G. So uh, this satellite will only use uh, only use the frequency band, which will be used by 6G, and it will test uh, the frequency in the space. So that is the only thing that is going to be uh, the, that associates that satellite with 
uh, you can say, uh, 6G. Yeah, so, so the, the, the industry is a fair while away from agreeing on 6G standards. And um, yeah, so I was going to say, what are the, the specs? What are all the specs that are on China's 6G satellite that was just launched? Uh, well, actually, I have been uh, trying to dig out the technical specification as well. Uh, the only thing that I have uh, gone to is that it is going to, it's only a 70 kg satellite. So it's not a proper, you can say, uh, a heavy satellite. So uh, most of the things that this satellite is going to perform is uh, for monitoring and uh, imagery. Imagery uh, that will be used to uh, for uh, deployment of smart cities uh, and smart communities and as well as agriculture and uh, uh, forest fire, wildfire and rescue operations. It will also, along with that purpose, it will also test uh, frequency band uh, in the tetrahertz uh, domain of uh, radio frequency spectrum in space because uh, once uh, finally 6G will be launched, uh, we will be uh, so much congested in the uh, existing radio frequency spectrum that we will have to move uh, to tetrahertz frequency range uh, so that it can provide the promised data rate and spectral efficiency. How, how will 6G satellites complement mobile communications and what service could be provided? Uh, what are the benefits to customers? Well, uh, if, uh, the, uh, if you're talking about uh, geostationary satellites, uh, it will uh, provide the backhaul connectivity, like it will be connecting the BTS stations to the core network, uh, which can be uh, summed up as cloud or PSTN and it will afford the remote communities which are not connected to the main uh, population through microwave or uh, optical fiber cable. So uh, satellite provides connectivity to those remote communities and it uh, basically uh, connects the access point or the base uh, station of those communities to the uh, 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 metropolitan area or uh, where the cloud and the core network is through satellite. So uh, this is the main purpose of geostationary satellite, which provides complement, which complement, which has been complementing cellular networks for uh, a long time. And uh, if you are talking about 16, so it will be geostationary satellite can only provide this uh, connectivity, only complement the cellular network for backhaul because of the latency. Uh, we cannot reduce the latency of geostationary satellite uh, as uh, the distance of geostationary satellite is at. 35,000, 36,000 kilometer altitude. So we cannot reduce the latency. Uh, but if you're talking about lower Earth orbit satellites, uh, we have been seeing the results of uh, SpaceX Starlink. We have been seeing results of OneWeb constellations. They are really promising. Uh, they are providing latency uh, as low as 20 milliseconds and uh, data rates uh, more than 100 Mbps. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the first generation of uh, lower Earth orbit uh, high throughput satellites. And who knows by 6G, actually 6G is, a look, we are looking to uh, 3GPP, the organization which develops the standards for uh, cellular networks, the third generation partnership project, is looking to start working on uh, 6G standards uh, from 2021. And uh, we are expecting a complete standard like we had uh, release 15 for uh, 5G. Uh, we are expecting the complete standard by 2028. So uh, the rollout of 6G will start after 2028. And uh, uh, then uh, there will be a lot of, well, who knows what happens, uh, but uh, if you can say the lower earth orbit satellites, their next generations, they will definitely uh, much more, uh, they will be in a position that can provide the front hall solution as well. <laughs> Meaning that the end user can be communicated directly through the satellites. We don't need any, uh, uh, you can say, um, any other uh, relays, data relays, or uh, any other bridge between uh, the access point and your user. Okay. Um, in uh, July, Amazon announced it will invest over $10 billion in its satellite internet network after receiving FCC authorization to operate a system comprising of over 3,000 satellites. And they'll deliver high throughput, low latency broadband services to millions of underserved customers. What is Bezos up to? We're seeing a battle between traditional telcos and hyperscalers, um, a big tech hyperscalers looking to dominate space and what's in it for them? Uh, well, uh, Bezos uh, is basically, uh, it's uh, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, the cloud services and the satellites uh, which will be there. Uh, actually, uh, it is going to provide, uh, uh, there is another news which uh, you might have uh, missed that 
uh, Microsoft is partnering with SpaceX Starlink. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you talk about uh, software industry or if you talk about cloud services, then uh, we say that Amazon and Microsoft are competitors. And if you talk about space industry, we see Musk and Jeff Bezos are competitors. So uh, this competition is basically uh, getting into multi-billion industry. And uh, Bezos already has a cloud services. Bezos already have, uh, uh, you can say, online shopping, one of the biggest online shopping um, portals. And uh, the, the difference between Bezos and Musk uh, is that Musk is up, uh, coming up with 42,000 satellites and Bezos is all, uh, only uh, with 3,000 satellites. So what, if you look at the history of Starlink, uh, Elon Musk started with uh, only 1,200 satellites. It started with uh, moving up and it uh, uh, went up to 12,000. Now it is 42,000. So this is the first application of uh, uh, Project Kuiper from Amazon. Uh, and uh, it, it is the first uh, release of these satellites. So it, uh, it is likely that the number of satellites is going to increase. But the other thing that Bezos is doing is uh, he is establishing a network of ground stations around the globe. And he has introduced a technology known as ground station as a service. So uh, initially they are uh, starting with 12 ground stations, uh, one in, uh, I think one uh, is in Sydney and Singapore and uh, Middle East. So there will be 12 ground stations which will be providing services to these satellite as well as any other satellites uh, or constellations which want to have their uh, satellites communicate for uh, monitoring and control or uh, for a data relay as well. So uh, actually uh, they are targeting the whole globe. Uh, actually we have more than 3 billion people which are not served with uh, internet service. This is. So it's a big market, 3 billion people will be reachable. So they are investing in that. And uh, obviously uh, the other 3 billion people who will be uh, re reached through these services uh, will obviously get onto Amazon and they will uh, subscribe to Amazon Prime and watch his uh, TV shows and uh, do online shopping. And they can have uh, uh, their businesses uh, served through uh, Amazon web services. So who knows? Uh, so three billion people is a big market. And the, the concerns about the weaponization of space, how will the military industry and governments use 6G satellites for warfare? Yeah, actually, if you're talking about the warfare, uh, it, is, it is going to be the combination of, uh, I think, three dimensions of warfare. Uh, the third dimension, that is the air, uh, the fourth dimension, which is space, and the fifth dimension, which is cyber uh, warfare. So this is going to be the combination of three dimensions, and it is going to make those command and control situation really complicated. Uh, not only uh, satellites were being used in the Cold War era as well for monitoring uh, the movement or uh, deployment of missiles by uh, enemies uh, in different region. Uh, satellites were, have already been used for monitoring purposes. But now, like uh, we have uh, ex um, uh, seen a lot of countries uh, have uh, tested anti-satellite missiles. They have destroyed their own expired satellites in uh, orbit just to test their weapons. And this is just the beginning. And as I said, the space race 2.0 is much more complicated than the initial space race. It is commercial, it is uh, political, it is, uh, uh, so that's why, uh, as you, we have seen that US, uh, US has established a space command as well. It's a total, a new uh, force which will be dealing with those uh, uh, threats or uh, getting a supremacy over the space. I've, I've seen one thing, uh, directed energy, um, they're, they're going to be designing and developing uh, and conducting feasibility demonstration for a space-based directed energy intercept layer that comes from a um, United States uh, defense uh, budget document. Um, Under Secretary of Defense um, for Research and Engineering, Mike Griffin said in 2019 during a round table um, that directed energy to me is where we want to go in the long run. Um, so I've got a question around that. What sort of power output could a 6G satellite um, generate and could RF technology in space be used as directed energy weapons similar to those that have been developed by companies such as Lockheed Martin? Just asking for a friend. 
Yeah, actually, uh, directed energy for uh, radio frequency spectrum, it's uh, it is not really uh, it is not going to harm uh, really if you are talking about radio frequencies. Uh, but if you are talking about spectrum beyond radio frequencies like uh, infrared, or uh, we are talking about ultraviolet or gamma rays, then, then definitely it can be really uh, dangerous to any device or any. Uh, uh, living thing or non-living thing. So, radio frequencies, uh, the uh, maximum thing they can pro do is uh, they can heat up uh, any uh, given in any given like we use our microwave ovens. So, uh, it, it is not uh, powerful enough. The radio frequencies are not powerful enough to create ions in anything. Or, so only thing they can provide is they can heat up. And even to that, for example, if you are talking about microwave oven. Uh, we have a thousand watt uh, microwave on in a very closed chamber, so it heats up our food in a few seconds. Uh, even then, we have a hot ball of soup with cold soup in it. So, uh, thousand watt, and uh, when we are talking about uh, satellites, uh, generating thousand watt is a big question. Uh, more than thousand watt, obviously, it's uh, a space. It's not a closed chamber like microwave oven. So if you're talking about uh, geostation satellite, 37,000 kilometers uh, in altitude, uh, we will need a lot of, lot of transmit power and which will be a very big question to generate on, uh, on the platform like geostation satellite because of the uh, electrical power it can uh, accommodate uh, through the solar panel and the battery banks. So if the weaponization has to be done, it uh, has to be in any other band uh, apart from radio frequency band, maybe gamma rays, maybe uh, ultraviolet, or maybe uh, infrared. So radio frequency, uh, I do not recommend. Yeah. Just for okay. your friend. Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. So there we have it. 6G satellite technology it has a long way to go before it's, um, it's even its full capabilities are known, but at this stage, you know, they'll be around 100 times faster than 5G using high frequency terahertz waves to achieve data transmission speeds. And um, from space, you'll be able to download a whole season of Deadwood in two seconds. That's roughly the same time that Joe Barden will remain in office. Thanks a lot <laughs> for joining, Mohammed. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Cleo. Have a good one. And thank you again for inviting me. Really an honor to talk to you.